in the previous lecture we discussed in quite some detail about different kinds of flip flops and how they work so essentially what we saw was that unlike latches flip flops respond to the edge of the enable input whereas latches respond to the actual level of the enable input so as such in the state table there is no difference latches and flip flops or if rather i should say if a latch has a certain state table if it is converted into a flip flop it will also have the same state table for example the sr latch and the sr flip flop the d latch and the d flip flop so the state table uh remains uh, the same when a latch is converted into a flip flop except that the state table essentially holds true when that latch is converted into a flip flop but only at the edges of the enable signal and in case of the flip flops this enable signal is called as a clock signal because those edges provide unique distinct instances of time when the change in the circuit output or the circuit state can take place so therefore flip flops are called as edge triggered circuit elements you can have positive edge triggered flip flops you can have negative edge triggered flip flops along with sr and d we also saw two more flip flops which are not essentially latches they are only flip flops that is the jk flip flop and the d flip flop sr d jk and t so now let us uh, once again go back to the gated sr latch which we had discussed couple of lectures ago so the gated sr latch looks something like this Q and Q bar are the states. This is S, R, and this is the enable. This is what we know the gated SR latch to be. So when we construct its state table, that is for the case when enable is equal to one, this is what we see. This is the SR R, the present inputs, and the next state Q plus. so over here the q plus becomes like this q 0 1 and forbidden now this is forbidden because the q and q bar essentially become equal something that we don't want now suppose by some you know mistake s and r become one and we enter the forbidden state okay so this is something that we don't want or let us say i put s equal to 1 and r equal to 0 q becomes equal to 1 q bar becomes equal to 0 now 
suppose without changing the values of s enable or r can i do something to force the q into a pre decided value so rather i can say can the value of q that is the state can the value of q be forced into a certain value certain known value let us say either 0 or 1 without changing either s enable or r well let's see how this is possible this facility if we have if we have the facility to force the q into a certain known value in the unlikely event that the output essentially becomes a forbidden state where q and q bar both become equal to 1 we can change the value we can change the value of the state variable often without having to deal with s and r this may also be useful if let us say the s r and enable these signals are being given by some other circuit or let us say as a user we may not always have access to these inputs physically but can we have access to some other inputs which can bring out the circuit out from the forbidden state let us see how this can be done so if i want to force the output into some known value i have two possible choices force q to 0 or 1 i can force it to 0 i can force it to 1 forcing it to 0 is called as resetting that is through the r input but in this case we don't want to use s or r so i should say without using s r inputs then in that case if you are forcing this q into the state 0 without using the s or the r inputs this is called as clearing and if you are forcing it to 1 without using s or r that is called as presetting so therefore let us define how we can introduce two additional inputs which are very very combinational in nature and and uh, how we can do this clearing and presetting business now what i'm going to do is i'm going to introduce one input over here and the other input over here okay so 
what I have done is I have introduced two additional input, two additional inputs in this butterfly structure. One on this gate, another on this gate. Okay. So over here now, let's let's call these inputs as some. C and P. All right. Now let us try to make a state table where the inputs are C and P and the output is the next state Q plus. Okay. Now let us say these two inputs are totally in our control. So therefore, if I make CP as 0 and 0, what will happen? Again, Q and Q bar will become equal. So therefore, this is again forbidden state. This is something we don't want. Now we make C as 0, P as 1. So if C is 0, what will happen is Q will immediately become 1. Q will immediately become 1 and then this one will come over here. This one will come over here. And over here P is 1. Okay. So over here P is 1. So we have two ones, one coming from this Q, the other one coming from P. Of course, we don't know anything about what is coming from here. Okay, it, it may depend on what is um, the value of enable and R, something of that kind. So supposing by some chance this becomes zero. The output from the first NAND gate becomes 0. So the inputs are 1, 0 and 1. So the output will again be 1. Okay. But then we are saying that we are somehow making this Q equal to 1 because C is 0. If C is 0, Q will become 1 no matter what is the value of S. Or not S, rather the output from this first NAND gate. All right. So when C is zero and P is one, the analysis now needs to be a little bit more detailed. You need to consider what are the possible values of enable S and R. Now let us say enable is equal to one. Let us say for, for the sake of discussion that the enable is equal to 1. Of course, if the enable is equal to 0, the easiest case happens because these two now become 1. So therefore, in that case, Q plus will be forced to 1. Now, what if enable is equal to 1? That time it depends on what the value of S and R are. Okay, so I leave this to you as an exercise to find out what can happen. Uh, so, let us say we have done that. Now, when C is equal to 0, what is happening and P is equal to 1, what will happen is Q plus will be equal to 1. Now, let us take the reverse case. When C is 1 and P is 0. When C is 1 and P is 0, the opposite will happen. This time Q bar will become 1. So therefore Q will become 0. 
Now when C and P are both 1 and 1. When C and P are both 1 and 1. Essentially what will happen is that now they will not matter. Because the inputs to the two NAND gates are now 1's. It will totally depend on what is S, E, N and R. So this is as per the next state will follow as per the normal state table of the SR latch. As per the SR latch state table. Okay. So, so, let us say something like this is happening. When clear is 1, so let's call this C as clear or and P as preset as per their functions. So when clear is 1 and preset is 0, the state will be clear. When preset is 1 but clear is 0, state will be pushed to 1 or forced to 1. Okay. So but then uh, it's like saying when preset and clear are both 1. Ideally, we expect that that cannot happen. You cannot preset and clear at the same time. Okay, so what we will do, we will essentially just change these. Let's call this as P and this as C. So we will just simply redraw this table P, C and Q plus. So this is forbidden this is 1 0 and we will call this as normal normal latch operation this is the normal latch operation so p and c is like this now why did, did i change this what i see is when i am making p as 0 and c remains 1 the output becomes 1 when C is 0 and P is 1, the output becomes 0. So we can say that P and C are active low inputs. Because when P and C are both active, that is not possible. You cannot say that I will make the state variable uh, 1 and 0 at the same time. That's not possible. So therefore, when both are trying to be active, the state variable becomes forbidden. So 1, 1 means P and C are now both inactive. So therefore, they are inactive and S and R and E N will now dictate what is Q and Q bar. Alright. So with these two inputs, additional inputs, which are active low in nature, we call this as preset input and the clear input. Okay. So for small, you can write it as PR and CLR. Alright, so this is a very handy feature which is available in most latches and flip-flops. We saw the example of the latches. So, supposing we were to now show the latch and flip-flop symbol with all these inputs. Let us see how we can show. So, let's say latch with Preset clear and flip flop with preset clear. So the symbol of latch, as we know, looks like this. Let us say we have a D latch and a D flip flop, just for an example. So this is D input, then we have the enable input. Q and Q bar are over here. These are the state outputs. Now, the preset and clear are shown in the top and bottom. But since those are active low, which we saw, let us say, we will show them using a bubble. In general, you can have latches and flip-flops with active high preset and clear also. Okay, what the example that we saw was just for 
uh, active loop. So over here, the flip flop, let us say, is positive edge triggered. Then we will show the clock like this. The D input is over here. Q and Q bar are over here. But the preset and clear will be shown in the same way. All right. Now, now, when it comes to flip flops, when it comes to flip flops, the preset and clear are of two types. Only for flip flops, you have two types of preset clear. One is called as asynchronous preset clear. The other is called as a synchronous, synchronous preset clear. Now what this means? Asynchronous preset clear is what we just saw. It is independent of the S, R and EN. So anytime you make those preset and clear active, the output will go to either 1 or 0, the state. However, synchronous means what? If you make the preset and clear, either of them active at any point of time, that change will not take effect until the next positive edge comes in this case or the negative edge in case of a negative edge triggered flip flop. So I will say sensitive to clock edge that is synchronous preset and clear. This is does not depend on clock. All right. So these are these are two very important features. Of course, it looks as though asynchronous preset clear are more powerful, which they are. But there are also certain scenarios where you may need the synchronous preset and clear, especially if you don't want the user to have extreme control over the state control on the state outputs. Okay, so over here. Now, having established this, having established this, let us now look at one of the flip-flops which we had studied in the previous lecture. It's a T flip-flop. Its state table looks like this. There is one input T and the next state Q plus. For 0 and 1, for 0, Q plus is the same as the old state. And for 1, the Q plus is the complement of the old state. All right. So the reason why this input is called T is because it is it can toggle. If I make t equal to 1, the next state will be the complement of the old state or the present state. Okay, now let us see what this toggling phenomena is in detail. Okay, so let us say I have a t flip-flop which is positive edge triggered. Now let us say I give, as an example, I give the input logic 1 to t and there's a clock which is coming. Now suppose my clock is positive edge, I mean my clock is a waveform which will make which is and, and this flip flop is sensitive to the positive edge of the clock. Let us say my clock will be a unipolar square wave which looks something like this. And so on. Now let us say this clock waveform is being fed to the t, oh, sorry, to, to, to this clock input, to the t flip flop. 
Now the value of t is always 1. So therefore we must look at this row of the state table. And let us try to plot what is the q. Now initially let us say q is 0. Now this flip flop is positive edge triggered. So let us mark all the positive edges of the clock. Because these are the moments when the transition will cause or may cause some change in the output. Now Q is 0 so far and it is 0 until the first clock edge. Now in the first clock edge T is 1. So therefore the next state will be the complement of the present state. Present state is 0. So next state will be 1. So this is the way it will proceed. Now this one will continue till when? Till the next positive edge. So therefore I draw this and over here when this positive edge comes the present state is 1 so the next state will be the opposite of 1 which is 0 and this will continue again till the next clock edge. Again there will be a toggling. This opposite nature where the next state is becoming the complement of the present state, this phenomena is called as toggling. This is precisely what we are seeing over here. Okay. And then, once again we come over here, then again the state will toggle. And so on. <clears throat> now, let us look at something very interesting. This clock is a square wave. It is a periodic signal. It has a time period. Let us say, we will call this as T. The time difference between two successive clock edges. Okay. The time difference between two successive clock edges. What we are seeing is that the Q output is also is also a square wave but its time period has now increased the time period is now this much earlier time period was this much for the clock signal and for the output the clock or rather the time period has now become more in fact it has become exactly twice this is t this is also t. So therefore, this time period now is 2t. Okay, so let us say, I can say the base frequency of the clock input is 1 by t. So what is the base frequency of the q? That is 1 by 2t. That means, in terms of frequency, fq is equal to exactly f clock by 2. Okay, so this kind of circuit is called as a clock divider or a frequency divider. Clock divider or frequency divider. So, What it is doing essentially, it is taking some clock input, it is taking some clock input and it is dividing the frequency by 2. It is also called as a divide by 2 circuit. Okay, so this is something very very important. Now what you can do, you can modify the circuit. To have a divide by 4 also. You can modify the circuit to have a divide by 4 also. How can we do that? Simple. All we need is one more flip flop. So just like how we had the flip flop connected in this fashion.
the value is equal to 1. Let us have one more flip flop. Here also, the t is 1. And what I will do now, this q, I will feed as clock into the next flip flop. This is what I will do. Now, I have two flip flops where, you know, the state variables and the input variables, they look the same. So, therefore, I will call this as t0, q0 and q0 bar. This I will call as t1. Q1 and Q1 bar. Okay, so now suppose again the clock is like this. So on and so forth. So these are the edges. This one looks a bit thin, but it's okay. So Q0 will be exactly what we did so far. It will be exactly half the frequency. It will change up in every positive clock edge. Okay, so these at these times it will change. Okay, so these are the positive clock edges for Q1. Now, the clock is Q0. It does not have access to this clock. For the second flip-flop, the clock is Q0. So, therefore, this will be the new clock for the second flip-flop. So, therefore, Q1, we can draw again, assuming that in the initially the input is, uh, initially the state is 0, this. So, one change will happen over here. The next change will happen at the next positive edge of Q0. Likewise over here, likewise this way. So this is a divide by 2, q0 is a divide by 2, whereas if you notice q1, its frequency is exactly half of q0, so this is divide by 4. So the time period for the clock is t, the time period for q0 is 2t but the time period for q1 as you can see is 4t that's why q1 is called as a divide by 4 output okay so like likewise you can use n number of flip flops you can use n number of flip flops to divide the frequency by any power of 2 so therefore if i need one flip flop it is divided by 2 2 flip flops, it will be divided by 4. 3 flip flops will be divided by 8. So if there are n number of flip flops, it will be divided by 2 raised to n. Okay, so this is how it works. And this circuit essentially is very, very useful. This kind of clock divider circuits are used extensively in processing elements in the computer where there is a master clock signal. But there are devices which work at frequencies which are smaller than the clock signal. Generally the clock is the signal that has the highest frequency or the fastest speed. The clock in any circuit has the highest frequency. but in many circuits, especially the computer, not all the devices are as fast to work at the same frequency of the clock. So therefore, they need smaller frequencies. So in that case, the clock is divided by some factor to reach a frequency which can be, you know, suitable for those slower devices to work at. Okay. So. So now, now the question is, can something be done, can something be done using flip-flops besides 
just dividing the clock. Okay, let us see what to do. Let us say we have two flip flops. Let us say we have two flip flops, two T flip flops, but which are negative x triggered. So let us say I have again two T flip flops. This is T0, I'll call this as Q0, Q0 bar. This is T1, Q1, and Q1 bar. Now it is negative x triggered, so let us say the clock will come this way. I am showing a bubble over here and the Q0 itself will go as a clock for the next flip flop which is also negative edge trigger. Let us say T0 is 1, T1 is 1. Let us now try to draw what will happen to or what the Q0 and Q1 will look like when clock is like this. So now we are concerned about the negative edges. So these are the negative edges we should mark. Once again, assume initially that Q0 and Q1 are both 0. So if Q0 is 0, over here because T0 gets a 1, there will be a transition at the negative edge. Okay. So this will happen. Once again at this negative edge, one more transition will happen and this will go to 0. Now over here, another transition and over here, another transition. Now Q0 is going as a clock for the next flip-flop. So we have to now look at the negative edges of Q0 to analyze the next flip-flop. Let's now draw Q1. Now initially, we are assuming that Q1 is also 0. It will continue to stay 0 until the first negative edge that is over here. And in the next negative edge, it will again switch. Now, let us look at only Q1 and Q0. Specifically for those time durations when there is no change. Until this point, Q1 and Q0 are both 0. In this time period, Q1 is 0 and Q0 is 1. In this time period, Q1 is 1, Q0 is 0 and in this time period, both Q1 and Q0 are 1. Now notice something very interesting. If I treat Q1 and Q0 as a 2-bit binary number with Q1 being the more significant bit, I can see that the values are going from 00, 01, 10 and 11. Okay, so these two I am treating as 2 bits, 2 individual bits for a 2-bit binary number. So if I say that Q1 is the MSB, then 0, 0 means the number is 0 in decimal. 0, 1 means the number is 1. 1, 0 means the number is 2. 1, 1 means the number is 3. Now what are we seeing? We are seeing that it is generating a sequence of numbers. So far, this was 0 because there was not a single negative edge of the clock which had come. The moment the first negative edge comes, the value becomes equal to 1, which indicates one clock edge has arrived. When the second clock edge, that is I am talking about the main clock, has come, this value becomes 2, which indicates two clock edges have come. 
when the third clock edge comes it becomes 1 1 which indicates 3 but when the fourth clock edge comes it again becomes 0 0 because you cannot represent 4 using only 2 binary bits okay so this might sound very strange as to what exactly are we doing we have developed a circuit which developed we have developed a circuit which can count the number of clock edges which have come of course it can count only up to three but let's not debate about that for the moment we have developed a circuit which can count clock edges okay now you will say obviously it can count up to three what to do if we need to count more than three just like i told you four cannot be represented using two bits so therefore we need a third bit now the third bit will come from where the third bit will come from a third flip flop and therefore let us draw that let us very quickly draw that which is just an extension of this circuit using negative edge triggered flip flops let's call this as t1 sorry t0 t1 and t2 u0 u0 bar q1 q1 bar q2 q2 bar so clock comes here to the flip-flop which is negative s triggered all the t's get an input of 1 and q0 will go as clock for the next flip-flop likewise q1 will go as a clock for the next flip-flop so let us say the clock looks like this and so let's look at the negative edges okay so q0 now let's draw it very quickly it will change only at the negative edges like this and like this like this and like this like this and like this now q0 is going as clock for the next flip flop so let us look at the negative edges of q0 to calculate what q1 will now be so q1 will also switch at the negative edges of q0 in this way now q1 is going as clock for the next flip flop so the negative edges will have to be marked like this so therefore q2 will look like this it will change at the first negative edge again it will change at the next negative edge so ensure that you draw these transition lines which indicate the timing correctness okay so now let us again do that exercise where we are looking at periods where they are not changing so in this period the values are 0 here it is 0 1 if you are treating q2 now as the msp then it becomes 0 1 0 then 0 1 1 1 0 0 1 0 1 1 1 0 1 1 1 so once again we can see that this circuit is now modified to count three bit numbers so they are going from 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 and 7 so three bit means you can count up to seven clock pulses or it's you can count eight different states so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So when the 7th edge comes, you see the count becoming 7. Okay, so this circuit is called as a 3-bit counter. It is able to count, so this circuit is called as a counter. 
Likewise, this previous circuit is called as a 2-bit counter. Because it is able to count 2 bits in the previous one and 3 bits here. Alright. So, let us quickly look at some other features of these counters. Let us look at some other flip-flops. Sorry, let, let us look at some other features of these counters. So, suppose you want to count n number of clock edges. Number of clock edges to be counted. Okay. So the question is, if I want to count n number of clocks, how many flip-flops do I need? So, if n is number of flip-flops, ff means flip-flops, that will be equal to log of n to the base 2. Okay. Suppose n is 16. If n is 16, then log of 16 to the base 2 will be 4. So, what we saw was in a 3-bit counter, we can count from 0 to 7. It's not counting 7 clocks, but it's actually counting 8 clocks, if you consider that, that 0 also. So, let us say if n is 16, that counter will be a 4-bit counter. Log of 16 to the base 2 is 4, and that counter will count from 0 to 15. But actually, it is counting 16 different states. Okay, now suppose, what if n is not a power of 2? What if n is not a power of 2? Suppose we want to count from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Is it just that flip-flops can be used only to count powers of 2? We don't want that. We should be able to use them to count any number. So how many states are there? There are a total of 6 states. In such case, how many flip-flops will be needed? In that case, you need to use the same formula, but you need to use the ceiling function. So log of 6 to the base 2 will be 2 point something and whose ceiling function will be to round off to the nearest higher integer that is 3. So even for counting up to 5, you need 3 because 5 is essentially 101. You need 3 bits, so therefore 3 flip-flops. Okay, so general solution, for n is that it is equal to log of capital N to the base 2 with the ceiling function. Okay, so, so now, what we saw was for the 3 bit counter, The count goes from 0, 1, all the way to 7. That means here capital N is 8. Therefore, this is also called as a modulo 8 counter. Why? Because the word modulo comes from the word modular division. If you do modular division with respect to 8, the possible remainders will be anything from 0 to 7. And that is called as modular function. In short, it is also called as a mod 8 counter. Okay, it is called as a mod 8 counter. Now, since we have used three flip flops, since we have used three flip flops in the case of three bit counter, the first flip flop gives us divide by two, third flip flop, sorry, the second flip flop gives us divide by four. And the third flip-flop gives us divide by 8. So therefore, this is also called as a divide by 8 counter. Okay, it's called a divide by 8 counter. So, in this particular lecture, 
we looked at how latches can be modified to have preset and clear inputs. Even flip-flops can be modified in a, sim in a similar way. Thereafter we saw thereafter we saw how to do clock division and counting using flip-flops. In particular we used the T flip-flop. We did not make use of the preset or clear in these applications but we shall also see how to make use of them but in the next lecture. Thank you.